Now that we've established the basic groundwork behind the study of physiology, we're going to now be looking more specifically at the endocrine system. And in order to understand how the endocrine system works, we have to understand how the body itself works in terms of its relationship to the environment. And that's going to be based off of this understanding of environmental exchange. And that's what we'll entitle this next flowchart. Environmental exchange. And this exchange is specifically going to be between the body, the human body that is, and the subsequent environment, the surrounding environment. So, first and foremost, we have to establish the following. Animals, like you and I, we are not, not equal to closed systems. AKA animals are open systems. This would mean that because we're not closed systems, animals therefore are not isolated from their environment. This shouldn't be in use to anybody. The environment affects us as animals and thus we are not isolated from it. It has a strong effect on what we do and how we do it. So in, because of this interaction between us and the environment, animals like you and I, we need to exchange with the environment. That's the key here. We need to exchange with the environment. And simple things that we need to exchange include things like gases, we need the oxygen from the environment. We need to exchange our carbon dioxide waste product. And that's going to be different in terms of what the plants want from us and want from their environment. We also will exchange nutrients with the environment. The environment provides us nutrients and we take and give certain things and also waste. We cannot store our waste within us. It has to be released somehow in some way and thus that waste releasing will be an environmental exchange as well. These are just three examples of ways that we exchange with our environment. Now, because we need to exchange with the environment, there needs to be a specific form of entry and exit, since we're not closed systems. So there's going to be an entry slash an exit of a substance that's worth understanding in order for us to really understand what it means to exchange with the environment. Now, the entry and exit of a substance is critically uh, relies on the fact that it, the, whatever the substance mu is, it absolutely must be um, dissolved in an aqueous environment. So must dissolve this substance in what we would consider an aqueous environment. Now this will make a little bit more sense as we move forward and understand the the importance of an aqueous environment, specifically internal, because of the following reason. We cannot just take a substance and absorb it. It has to dissolve in an aqueous environment because it can only then move through our plasma membrane once it's dissolved through an aqueous environment, an aqueous solvent, let's say. Once you do that dissolving, it can then move through the plasma membrane. Remember, the plasma membrane governs the entry and the exit because it's a semi-permeable membrane in every single one of our cells that allows us to take in things from the environment and remove things to the environment in the long run, let's say. And thus, this plasma membrane, because it's fluid and it itself is found in an aqueous internal environment, we must dissolve whatever substance we get from the environment in a similar aqueous-like solvent. Therefore, simply speaking, what we have to remember is that because of this aqueous necessity, whatever things that, I'll just call them generally things that we're exchanging with the environment, whatever they may be, they simply, the number one rule is that they can't be dry. They have to be dissolved in some sort of aqueous solvent or environment for us to successfully allow them to enter and exit our cells. Again, look what we're looking at. We're seeing a cellular level of structure in terms of the plasma membrane and function. The function would be the entry and exit from the structure that is the plasma membrane. So it's a very important distinction and idea to understand with this idea uh, that animals are not closed systems. Moving forward, if we sort of do a simple comparison of those things that are single cellular versus multicellular, we see a stark difference. Let's say we're looking at a single celled organism, whatever it may be, like a protist maybe. Some of them are single celled, so we'll take a look at it. What we notice about a single celled organism is this a very important rule of surface area to volume ratio. SA double dot volume would be surface area to volume ratio. And what I would say is that the surface area to volume ratio in these cells, these single celled organisms, is sufficient. It's sufficient for this one cell and it's successful for that reason. But if we look at animals, 
let's say you and I, which are complex, very much multicellular animals, what happens is as we increase size in terms of uh, the cellular level of an organism or the organization, I should say, the animal gets more complex and thus it has to decrease its surface area to volume ratio. But this decrease is bad. We know that we, need, we want a high surface area to volume ratio. So we're going to have to combat that. So animals do this sort of aqueous environment dissolving because of the following reason. What animals do is that they exchange via the plasma membrane of each cell. So what we have now is because even though we're not one cell organisms, let's, let me finish writing this, of each cell, what we have to still do is exchange with the environment. These guys, no problem exchanging. They are themselves just one cell. So what we do is we act as if we are one cell because one cell is what's going to exchange with the environment because that one cell has a plasma membrane that allows for a simple entry and exit for things that we need. Therefore, what we understand is that because the cell is the level of function and the functional unit, Every cell, therefore, within this multicellular animal organism must be in an aqueous environment. Must absolutely be in an aqueous environment. Why is that? Well, that's because the plasma membrane dictates that. It needs to be fluid, and the environment thus must have an aqueous sort of surrounding uh, each, in each and every cell for successful entry and exit and exchange with the environment. Take a look at figure 40.3 to clear this up even more. Figure 40.3 shows the direct environmental exchange that animals have with their environment. Finally, last thing about environmental exchange, we have to also understand that animals themselves are going to be with compact masses of cells because they're multicellular, so they're compact masses of cells. The key word here is compact, and also they are they involve a complex, so a compact and complex internal organization. Now, what is the purpose of this compact nature? What is the purpose of this complexity in terms of internal organization? It serves the following reason. We're going to ask ourselves this question. Why do we need to be complex on the inside and compact with ourselves? Well, this is all because of that golden rule of anything in biology and especially anything in physiology. This is all going to increase the surface area to volume ratio. And when you increase the surface area to volume ratio, specifically in a multicellular organism that already has this difficulty of having a sufficient surface area to volume ratio because it has so many cells, because it is so complex, when you increase that surface area to volume ratio, you're then going to have a greater capability of doing many different environmental exchanges. For example, let's look at an anti-example. What if you had an organism that had a very low surface area to volume ratio, an animal, let's say, with a low surface area to volume ratio would therefore have less contact with the environment. So let's write that down as less contact with the environment. If you have less contact with the environment, you automatically have less exchange with the environment. Less contact means less exchange. Less exchange is simply going to be very, very, let's just call this generally speaking, very bad. So what is very bad? A low surface area to volume ratio. Why is it very bad? Less contact, less exchange, less entry and exit. Thus, you are not going to be a successful cell. Thus, you won't be a successful tissue. You won't be a successful organ. You won't be in a successful system. You won't be a successful organism because of this one golden rule of surface area to volume ratio. So how do animals combat this? Well, animals do a great job of this because animals have some ways to make sure we, they increase the surface area to volume ratio. Animals have certain specialized structures. And these specialized structures will be, of course, internal. Okay? They will be internal structures, as we said up here. But these specialized structures will be specifically compact in nature. Specifically, when we say specialized, we mean that they're probably going to be very branched. They're going to be very folded. The brain is a very folded uh, organ within the body. The digestive system has many different branches within the body. All of this is done in an effort to increase what? The number one thing that animals and cells want to do, increase surface area to volume ratio. And also what we do is we make sure that all of this is internal. 
we internally have these branches and folds. We don't see branches and folds on the outside of our skin, right? They're all inside of us and in our organs. Why is it internal though? The internal nature of this is because when you have it internal, you're actually protecting it from outside trauma. So let's write that down. Protected from outside trauma. So when you hit yourself or if you bang yourself into a wall, let's say, run into a wall, you don't die, right? All your internal organs and systems are okay for the most part if it's not too serious. And that's because they're protected with this exterior that does not have the branches and folds or specialized structures. It does not have your heart, let's say, on the outside. It's all internal because that internal nature allows for a protection from the outside trauma that might be induced, whatever that may be, that trauma. And then finally, animals also are going to have internal body fluids. So the key word there again is internal, internal body fluids. What is the purpose of a fluid? Specifically, remember, everything needs to be dissolved in an aqueous environment. The internal body fluids are simply going to be the critical link, the link that's going to uh, allow exchange surfaces. So let's write this down as exchange surfaces surfaces. So we link exchange surfaces with the body cells. How do we do that? Well, we use things like ISF, which is just interstitial fluid, and we also use things like circulatory fluid, all of which is internal. Circulatory fluid would be better known as something we're all quite familiar with. This is just blood. So what do we do? We dissolve things in blood. We dissolve things in interstitial fluid. We allow them to dissolve in there so that they can get enter the body cells easily because the body cells have this plasma membrane structure that needs and requires things to be in an aqueous environment. Thus, the most of our internal structure is full of blood. Most of our internal structure is thus full of an aqueous solvent. And thus, we are capable of environmental exchange.